When it comes to disruption, the elephant in the room is Tesla. In this video, we'll look at how Tesla is positioned to be a clear winner in this disruption. In the following videos, we consider how high the stock price may go in the next decade and look at strategies for investing in Tesla. Let's start by recapping our core theory, and it states that due to cost declines of battery storage and AI compute power, and the convergence of these technologies, we are on the threshold of a transition from traditional internal combustion engine powered cars to electric vehicles driven by artificial intelligence. So we have two components here, we've got the batteries and we've got the AI compute. So we're basically looking at a computer on wheels where everything is driven by software and everything is electric. And so we're going to examine these two components in turn, starting with the batteries. If we look at this graph from Arc Invest, showing a projected cost decline for the Model 3, which over time will drop to a production cost of, of the order of 20 to 25,000 over the next five years, due to the decreasing costs of lithium-ion batteries, as we discussed in our first video. Let's also remind ourselves of the S-curve transition that is approaching the tipping point at the moment. So as we can see at the beginning of 2020, we can already see a huge surge in interest in electric vehicles, huge surge in purchases in Europe, China's pushing them very hard. Uh, many cities have plans to ban internal combustion engine cars. So we're really starting to see uh, that point where mass adoption starts. So why Tesla? Well, they are unarguably the disruptor in the transition to electric vehicles. It was really their work with the first the Roadster and the Model S that showed that electric vehicles could be fast and sexy and something that people want to own and could even be better than traditional internal combustion engine powered cars. And obviously they've then taken that to the next level with the Model 3 and the Model Y coming out very soon. So they create the most efficient electric vehicles getting more range out of a kilowatt of electricity than any of the competitors, as we can see from this chart. Now, because most cars will be owned by fleets in the future, that efficiency, and therefore lower cost base, will drive fleets to buy Teslas, as they will become more profitable to run than other cars that are not as efficient. Also, they have the most advanced plans to scale battery production. So, if we are to transition in the way that the S-curve shows, by the middle of the decade, we need to be producing something of the order of 25 million electric vehicles. And really only Tesla has a roadmap to get to a scale in the terawatts, as we're about to hear from Elon Musk. At Battery Day, we're going to do a comprehensive review of cell chemistry um, module and pack uh, architecture and um, a manufacturing plan that uh, has a clear roadmap to a terawatt hour per year. Many of you will be familiar with Master Plan Parts 1 and 2, with 2 being the one in operation at the moment. But according to Elon, what they're going to set out at Battery and Powertrain Investor Day is in some ways Master Plan Part 3. To some degree, like Battery Day will, will be kind of like Master Plan Part 3, um, which is like, okay, how, how do we get from uh, kind of in the tens of gigawatt hours per year to, uh, you know, multiple terawatt hours per year. In, in order to re really make a fundamental shift in the world's uh, energy usage and, and, and really uh, really transform things to a sustainable energy future, um, if you're not in the terawatt hour range, it's, it's like it's, it's, a, it's a nice news story, but it's not fundamentally changing the energy equation. By that measure, other automakers are in the nice new story space. Here's General Motors teaming up with LG Chem to create their own equivalent of the Gigafactory 1 and targeting 30 gigawatt hours 
per year, which is the capacity that Tesla is already at, and probably not going to come online till around 2022 or 2023. Okay, so let's move to the artificial intelligence part. So let's start by looking at the hardware. So first you need a sensor suite to collect the data that the artificial intelligence is going to use to drive the car. Teslas are all built with eight cameras, a suite of ultrasonics, forward-facing radar, accelerometers, etc., etc. Controversially, Tesla has chosen not to use LiDAR, unlike all the other companies trying to solve the autonomy problem. Are cameras alone sufficient? Research from Cornell University suggests they are. One of the essential problems in self-driving cars is to identify objects around the car. For example, other cars, pedestrians, etc. The goal is to basically put bounding boxes around objects so that we can circumvent them and do that you know, as precisely as possible. LiDAR is very precise, but a drawback of LiDAR is that it's very expensive and it sticks out on the top of your car, so it induces wind resistance. The question is, can we also do 3D object detection without a LiDAR? And the way you would do this is by using stereo cameras. So the same way humans have two eyes, and we can see depth with our two eyes, you could also have two cameras in the car. Each object, you see how far off is in the right and left camera, and that tells you how far away it is. The trick is to take the data that you have, convert it to 3D information, then change the perspective, and then analyze it from above you can identify the cars with a very, very high accuracy, very close to what we get with LiDAR, just at a fraction of the cost. Now, Elon has said that he's not anti-LiDAR, he just doesn't think it makes sense in cars. Given his track record, it will be a brave, or perhaps a foolish person, who says he's wrong on this. Second, you need the compute power to process the data that's being collected by all the sensors and make inferences in real time. Um, the industry will be using NVIDIA chips or others to do this. And in fact, Tesla's version 2 hardware was based on NVIDIA. But they concluded more than three years ago that that wasn't going to be fast enough for them and they wanted to move faster. So they took a leaf out of Apple's playbook. They recruited an engineer from Apple and started their own chip design. Um, I was hired in February of 2016. I asked Elon if he was willing to spend all the money it takes to do full custom system design. And he said, well, uh, are we going to win? And I said, well, yeah, of course. So he said, I'm in. And uh, so that got us started. We hired a bunch of people and, and started thinking about what a, full, uh, what a custom design chip for full autonomy would look like. So th this whole program from the f hiring of the first few employees to having it in full production in all three of our cars is just a little over three years and is probably the fastest uh, system development program I've ever been associated with. And it really speaks a lot to the advantages of having a tremendous amount of vertical integration um, to allow you to do concurrent engineering and speed up deployment. Here's what it looks like. Uh, over there on the right, you see all the connectors for the video that comes in from our, the eight cameras that are in the car. You can see the two self-driving computers in the middle of the board, and then on the left is the power supply and some control connections. As I said earlier, there's two fully independent computers on the board. Uh, you can see them there highlighted in blue and green. Uh, to either side of the large SOC, you can see the DRAM chips for, that we use for storage, and then below left, you see the flash chips that represent the file system. So these are two independent computers that boot up and run their own operating system uh, yeah, if I can add something, the, I mean, the general principle here is that it, any part of this could fail, and the car will keep driving. So you could have cameras fail, you could have uh, power circuits fail, you could have one of the Tesla full, full self-driving computer chips fail, car keeps driving. Uh, the probability of, the, of this computer failing is substantially lower than somebody losing consciousness. So in, in terms of driving the car, the basic sequence is collect lots of information from the, the world around you. Not only do we have cameras, we also have radar, GPS, maps, the IMUs, ultrasonic sensors around the car. We have wheel ticks, steering angle. We know what the acceleration and deceleration of the car is supposed to be. All of that gets integrated together to form a plan. Once we have a plan, the two machines exchange their independent uh, version of the plan to make sure it's the same. And assuming that we agree, we then act and drive the car. 
Now, once you've driven the car with some new control, you of course want to validate it. So we validate that what we transmitted was what we intend to transmit to the other actuators in the car. And then you can use the sensor suite to make sure that it happens. So if you ask the car to accelerate or brake or steer right or left, you can look at the accelerometers and make sure that you are, in fact, doing that. So there's a tremendous amount of redundancy and overlap in both our data acquisition and our data monitoring capabilities here. In terms of cost, the silicon cost of this solution is about 80% of what we were paying before. So we are saving money by uh, switching to this solution. And in terms of performance, we took the narrow camera uh, neural network, which I've been talking about, that has 35 billion operations in it. We ran it on the old hardware as, uh, in a loop as quick as possible, and we delivered 110 frames per second. We took the same data, the same network, uh, compiled it for hardware for the new FSD computer. Uh, and using all four accelerators, we can get 2,300 frames per second processed. So a factor of 21. If you compare it to, uh, say, NVIDIA's Drive Xavier solution, a single chip uh, delivers 21 teraops. Um, our full self of driving computer with two chips is 144 teraops. To be clear, like the, the, the strategy here, and it this, this started uh, you know, basically three, a little over three years ago, was uh, design and build a computer that is fully op optimized and aiming for full self-driving, then write software that is designed to work specifically on that computer and get the most out of that computer. So you have tailored hardware uh, that, is, that is a master of one trade, self-driving. Um, the, uh, NVIDIA is a great company, but they have many customers. And so when, as, as, they, as they apply their resources, they need to uh, do a generalized solution. Um, I, we care about one thing, self-driving. Um, so that it was designed to do that incredibly well. The software is also designed to run on that hardware incredibly well. Uh, and the combination of the software and the hardware, I think, is unbeatable. The first computer to deliver more than one teraflop of processing power was the ASCI RED that went online in 1997, and it cost of the order of $50 million, and it filled a whole room, as you can see in this photo. Now, Tesla is able to produce 144 times that processing power in a small board that fits behind the glove box and runs on about 75 watts of power. They've also said that their hardware 4, that they expect to come out in about a year to two years' time, will be around three times quicker than that. Meanwhile, NVIDIA have just announced their new chip, which will have around 200 teraflops of processing power, so around 40% faster than Tesla's current chip, but it won't be in cars until around 2022, by which time Tesla will already be on its hardware 4 and have leapfrogged them again. So the other part of the AI equation is data. Machine learning requires huge amounts of data to train the machine and then huge amounts of compute to do real-time inference on all, the data, on all the sensor data that's being captured. So you need mountains of data to recognize all the unique situations that happen out there in the world, um, when a hurricane blows in, where there's a snowstorm, all the various corner cases. And Tesla is collecting more data than any other company by around two orders of magnitude. As you can see from this graph, they currently have around 2 billion miles of autopilot data available, and that's expected to double to 4 billion in the next year. Now, the nearest is Waymo, who just a couple of days ago said that they'd reached 20 million miles, which was double the 10 million that they announced about a year and a half ago. So in the last year and a half, they've collected 10 million miles. Tesla is collecting that amount of data every couple of days. And the lead's getting bigger and bigger as they put more and more cars out into the space. The other thing to bear in mind is that most of Waymo's data is collected in a designated area within Phoenix, Arizona, and therefore does not contain the variety of data that Tesla's encountering. Now, they say they make up for this by simulations, but it seems likely that real data is far more useful than simulations. So we can see that Tesla is extremely well-placed. They've got the battery scale and the efficiencies of the EVs they're producing. They've got the compute power that they've designed and built themselves. They've got the most data. And the other big area where they're a winner is that they are a software company. For the traditional automakers, this is not in their DNA. An electric vehicle driven by AI 
is a very different problem to that that the traditional auto companies have been trying to solve over the last 100 years. Also, Tesla has access to the best engineers available. Now, if we look at this table of the companies that are most sought after by engineering graduates, we see that SpaceX and Tesla top the table, and the highest entry for traditional auto is Ford at number 16, followed by General Motors and BMW at 19 and 20. So the other thing to realise is that EVs driven by AI is going to be a platform and only two or perhaps three such platforms will see mass adoptions. It's going to be more like iOS and Android or Windows, Mac and Linux. Given their lead, it seems almost inevitable that Tesla will be one of the two or three that see mass adoption. And it's almost always the case that disruptors come from outside the industry. The other platform that sees mass adoption may well come from Google, given they've been a leader in the AI space for many, many years. And it could be that they adopt a model similar to Android, where they make the software and allow others, such as Volkswagen with their MEB, to make the hardware. So in that scenario, Volkswagen would be like a Samsung. They make the hardware that runs Android software and Volkswagen could make the hardware that runs Google's automated driving platform. In the next video, we look at how analysts are still undervaluing Tesla and consider just how high the stock could go in the next decade. If you enjoyed the video, please do press the like button and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us get found by others. I know I don't have all the answers and I want to learn from everyone who watches these videos so I can share that knowledge with you all. If you think I missed anything important or got something wrong or you have a suggestion for future content, please let me know in the comments. I really want your feedback and I will read all your comments. Please also consider supporting the channel on Patreon. You can do that at patreon.com slash profit from disruption. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you on the next video.